I see a few. I see a few squares. I see a few faces. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Starting to fill out. We got faculty members joining. They can't see you, Elle. That's that is my daughter. Our daughter is waving, but you know. <laughs> you don't have the video hear. turned on. <laughs> Just say hi. No, they they can't see you. Just say hi. <laughs> the life of uh, artists and parents is quite a juggle. Quite a life right now, especially yeah, with all Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So if you all hear hi. me pause or you hear this tiny, precious little voice, that will be our daughter crashing our uh, lecture here. <laughs> Say hi. hi. Adding, hi. adding to it, not crashing. Hi. There you go. What's your name? L. L. That's right. How old are you? <laughs> Three. Yeah, they can't see them. They can't see the fingers. <laughs> she's holding her fingers up, isn't she? Okay. I think we're starting to slow down. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a brief little intro. Uh, today, of course, the, the second I start talking, they always want to join. Uh, today we have uh, Kevin McCoy. Kevin McCoy is one half of the uh, duo Work Play, which is an interdisciplinary design duo based out of St. Louis. Uh, Kevin received his BFA in graphic communication from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Whoop, whoop. Hold on, letting a couple other people join in. Uh, do, do, do. And recently uh, graduated from Sam Fox School of Design and the Visual Arts uh, uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, earning his MFA. Uh, Danielle, who is not with us on the talk today, is a conceptual artist, writer, and educator. Together, they combine illustration, minimal contemporary design, along with experimental printmaking techniques into their art practice. With their use of design and printmaking, collaborative duo has expanded their practice to textile arts, site-specific installation, publications, and bookmaking to deliver an acerbic dose of revelation to inspire audiences and trigger experiences. They continuously experiment with new techniques, seeking to push beyond the perceived boundaries of art, design, and printmaking. Workplay has shown their work locally and nationally, including at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Spring Break Art Show in New York, the Sheldon Galleries in St. Louis, uh, Little Street Rooftop Gallery in Chicago, and O Cinema Wynwood in Miami. They attended residencies with Forest Park Forever, Acre, and Santa Fe Art Institute. They have sat on artist panels, given lectures, and continue to teach and work as studio artists and are involved in their local arts community here in St. Louis. So without further ado, if we could please give a warm welcome to Kevin McCoy. Emily, thank you so, so much um, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start out, I like people to loosen up. Um, my wife purchased a singing bowl, Tibetan singing bowl. I'm gonna strike this. And it's just to clear the air and, you know, take a deep breath, wiggle around, you know, relax. I'll sound it now. No, <laughs> not our pizza. And the reason, you know, um, before I kind of get into our spiel, um, we're very spiritual uh, artists. So a lot of the times things that we create, you know, we will never really take credit uh, for that work. We'll, you'll probably hear that again in this lecture. Um, we just try to really tune in to a higher source and um, let that take over and lead and guide us. So it's very intuitive, our process. So as Emily mentioned, I work alongside with my wife, Danielle. We do have a uh, practice that is called Work Play. It is kind of twofold. You know, it is uh, art discipline and also a design practice that kind of merge. And we like to blur the lines between the two. Um, and we like to address some of these, you know, notions of uh, representation, you know, disparities within our American society and also master narratives. Hold on for a second. All right, so I've been kind of working on, and my wife always gets on me about this. She says I'm, I'm long-winded and I'm a talker. Um, so rather than flipping through like 80-something slides, I did cut it down to like 55. 
Um, and I wanted to just focus on a few things to give you a more in-depth look uh, so you can understand the driving force behind the decision making and some of the things that we've created. Uh, so I'm gonna start out with a quote. So Nina Simone, she's an American songwriter. I'm pretty sure some of you have heard of her. Um, and I remember this quote, my wife actually told me about this. She says, an artist's duty, as far as I'm concerned, is to reflect the times, uh, which we certainly can attest to. And as artists, we continue to investigate some of these issues maybe that are ingrained within our society. You know, when we think about these issues, we think about the recent cries for justice in the form of protest. Uh, one of the most notable forms of protest that I can think about well, dates back to 1968. But there are also a few things to notate that was happening during that time. Um, how many, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Black Power Fist that was hoisted during the 68 Olympics. When I Googled it, this is exactly what I found. Of course, I uh, got rid of the Google logo. Uh, so one of the first things during 68 Olympics, which made a uh, notch in history from a design perspective is Lance Wyman. If you all are not familiar with him. Um, he was primarily the designer that created what you see here, which is the 1968 Olympic brand identity, really ahead of its time uh, for the 60s. Uh, his, he created a bunch of uh, creative assets that pretty much blanket the Olympic arena. Um, and this was deemed kind of the pinnacle of modern design. But also during 1968 in Mexico City, there was a lot of social unrest at that time. And people were taken to the streets to protest the political corruption that was going on. Um, also, another thing that happened during the 1968 medal ceremony was this where you have two African-American athletes. Hold on, sorry, got my phone stuck silent. Um, you have two African-American athletes, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, shown here, who staged one of the largest political demonstrations in the Olympic Stadium in Mexico City. Now, we had an exhibition uh, at Project Plus Gallery, which is located in the Central West End back in 2017, it's a group exhibition. And we decided to do a series called When Stars Align, kind of play on words. Uh, when Stars Align, meaning, uh, you know, actually stars, but also stars as in athletes when they align with their true inner purpose, um, which focused on Black athletes and political demonstration. That's what the work was really about. And Kaepernick was uh, a hot button at that time. And we were thinking about this series of work um, as clusters. So we're examining the similarities between the past and the present. And, you know, when we started doing research about the 60, 68 Olympics, I found out about these two African American runners and this article, which is seen here. Um, this is written by Brent Musburger. Um, he basically calls the athletes black skin stormtroopers, which you can see highlighted there, which is very, very potent. You know, words are very powerful and their meanings are very loaded. Um, also, notate the headline. Bizarre protest by Smith and Carlos tarnishes the medal ceremony. And so that, that line, black skin stormtroopers, is what we decided to kind of focus on. So in this work, we chose to pull the quote out of that article and silk screen it directly on top of this archival image using roofing tar. Um, we've had a lot of inquiries about how to print roofing tar. Um, people still don't believe that that's printed in roofing tar, but again, um, we just try to, you know, get ourselves in tune with a larger body or creative body or being to help us work through this process. And we were able to print it directly, cleanly um, in one pass. Um, so this was the work that pulled out that quote to reference that article. Now, keep in mind, you know, the reason for tar, tar is a very loaded material. Um, you think about tarred and feathered which is a metaphor for severe public criticism, but also the racial epithet tar baby. Um, speaking of public critique, you know, here is Colin Kaepernick um, and his refusal to stand during the anthem, which is definitely one to discuss. So we have something that is happening in the 68, 68 Olympics and also something that is happening current day. Um, Kaepernick, a lot of people don't know this, Kaepernick originally sat during the anthem uh, until he had a conversation with Nate Boyer. Now, Nate Boyer was a former Green Beret and also a fellow NFL player. And he wrote an open letter to Kaepernick suggesting that maybe he should kneel instead of sitting down to be respectful to those in the military. 
Um, and so soldiers take a knee uh, for a fallen, at a fallen soldier's grave to show respect. Uh, so Colin decided to take a knee instead. Nevertheless, he still refused to stand. Um, so when Kaepernick decided to take a knee, the public criticism still continued. It got worse. Um, the fact that he was taking a knee was paying respect to those that actually served in the military was never infused into public discourse. Well, we probably know why. Speaking on the subject of respectability of the military and the U.S. flag, I don't know if anyone remembers this. This is Kid Rock performing at the halftime show uh, at the Super Bowl in 2004. I think this was between uh, New England and the Patriots and the Carolina Panthers. And if you investigate the construction of his poncho, it is clearly a flag without question. No critique there. Here's another little interesting tidbit that a lot of people don't know. Um, what many NFL fans don't know is between 2012 and 2015, uh, the Department of Defense spent $6.18 million on what senators call paid patriotism. So this includes like American flag displays, ceremonies. Uh, as recently as 2015, the Department of Defense was doling out millions to the NFL for such things as military flyovers, flag unfurlings, and even enlistment campaigns. And interestingly enough, national anthem, and national anthem performances. Um, however, nothing was found in the contracts that mandated that players stand during the anthem. I wonder how many fans actually know that. Now back to Colin. So there was a bunch of people that were very enraged because of his refusal to stand. And they demonstrated their dislike by torching. I've seen some people actually shooting his jersey, peeing on the jersey. Uh, all of this could be found on YouTube. We certainly found it when we decided to make the piece. And what's funny is it was a protest of the protests. Now, let's take it a step further. This here. This is the doormat consisting of Oakland Raiders jersey, Marshawn Lynch, and of course, Colin Kaepernick's jersey. It's joined together and is simply uh, taped to the ground as a makeshift doormat. Uh, the message is very clear as well as disturbing. Lynch, Kaepernick. Now this was seen outside the Snafu Bar, which is located uh, in Lake Ozark in Missouri. That said, we decided to purchase a real jersey and frame it as memorabilia. You know, oftentimes many fans will frame their favorite athlete's jersey, maybe because of their accomplishments, accomplishments on the field. You know, they're basically relegated to just simply stats. Um, but black athletes are no, definitely no exception. You know, they're only celebrated for their athletic prowess. But the moment one decides to use their platform to speak on society's ills, watch out. I mean, look at LeBron. LeBron was talking about some of the things that's going on with, you know, our, our political, uh, political leanings and climate. And I think one person told him to just shut up and dribble, right? And so we wanted to celebrate Colin and frame his jersey and, and for his work done on and off the field. And so for this piece, we decided to kind of slightly torch and burn and singe that jersey to reference what we found on YouTube. Also, um, you'll see that the plexiglass is kind of smoky tint, which is also used to reinforce this conceptual idea. So, you know, sometimes, you know, work has to be thrusted out into the public sphere, whereas the gallery setting is probably not the best output. Um, that said, we decided to create a billboard, which was actually crowdfunded, by the way. You know, we live in a very tumultuous time. It's riddled with political turmoil and, of course, increased widespread violence. And that said, we decided to use our practice to make our voice heard in the public sphere. Pretty sure you remember this. Uh, back in 2017, there was certainly a lot going on, still is. Um, you know, many of you probably remember this picture of tiki torch carrying white men. I mean, you should remember unless you were hiding under a rock. Images like this began to surface um, after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, which took place August 11th and 12th, 2017. You know, and what we found interesting is during this rally, white supremacists, uh, Neo-Nazi and Trump supporters gathered to make their presence felt. Some of these folks kind of laid below the surface. 
um, because of the political uh, leadership, they decided to come on out and be bold with it. And, you know, we, we saw again, we saw some videos that surfaced, you know, Twitter, um, Instagram, YouTube, and there was some squirmishes between the supporters and the alt-right and counter-protesting. And from my own personal observa uh, observation of this video footage, you'll notice that the police took a very hands-off approach. They chose not to neutralize the tension between these two, the alt-right and counter-protesters. Whereas in Ferguson, people were peacefully protesting and they were met with rubber bullets, pepper spray, tear gas. Big difference. When it all, well, it all finally erupted. And that was when a motorist by the name of James Alex Field Jr. deliberately drove his car into a crowd of people who had been peacefully protesting at this rally. Unfortunately, the young lady by the name of uh, Heather Hayer, who was 32, died when, a, when that car hit a group of people protesting against this white nationalist rally. So with all that transpired in 2017, we opted to create a billboard in 2018. Uh, the billboard is typically a large advertising space that's used to promote a business or perhaps a product, but we wanted to use it as a space to challenge people to think critically about our political leadership and their actions. This piece is actually titled Grid and Services. Now, to take things a step further, um, again, you know, that billboard wouldn't have the same read in a gallery setting, uh, neither with this piece. Um, so we're invited to paint on a boarded up windows of the Red Rare Space, which again is in the Central West End. And this was kind of the height of, you know, nationwide protests against police brutality. And in all honesty, and let's be honest, my wife and I didn't know what to say. We kind of were at a loss of words. Um, we saw all of these images and videos circulating around Joyce Floyd's death. And then again, with the recent deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, which happened earlier in the year that surfaced, we found out about, and then of course, the tragic ending of Breonna Taylor. Um, this particular mural was designed to speak specifically to the white people that live, work, and play in the Central West End neighborhood. And how timely, right? This was painted well before that whole fiasco with the McCloskey. Now, shifting from public work, I want to show you how we use design to visually address things that I hear or read about, as well as my wife. Um, one day we, we got some mail, and typically I don't really pay attention to, you know, this junk mail, you know, I'll, I'll look at it and shred it. It's in the trash. But for whatever reason, uh, this stamp stood out. So we got some mail from an organization talking about the NRA. And I, I don't know, I, I didn't even trip off of the, the, you know, the sender or what the mail was about. I was just fixated on this stamp. Um, I don't know. I just started staring at the stamp. I don't know what happened. Like something just clicked. All of these things kind of came to mind. Um, and so I'll have these exercises that I'll do in my mind's eye where I'll see images within images. Uh, and so I'll create something that basically derivatives from pre-existing designs. So looking at that, this is what I came up with. Um, I want you to take a look at the eyes. You know, I like to incorporate some very subliminal messaging. Does anyone know or think or may guess where those eyes, the shape may have originated from? Give me a few seconds and then I'll spoil it. I feel like I need the, uh, <laughs> the music. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 the Kool-Aid Kool Man? What's that? Kool-Aid Man? No. No? Nope. One more try, anyone. <laughs> Don't yell all at, all at once. <laughs> no one? Just like ah. the comma? This, it's actually borrowed from the blood drop cross, not shown in, in its entirety, which is the primary symbol related to the KKK. Again, my way of trying to push and exercise and think about ideas and how to expand upon those ideas from a visual sense. Now, 
unfortunately, because of the Rihanna Taylor verdict, our heart is heavy. Um, and we don't want the world to forget her name or that incident. Um, if you don't know what happened, Brianna Taylor was fatally shot on March 13th, 2020 by three plainclothes um, Louisville Metro Police Department officers while executing. Now they're saying it wasn't a no-knock warrant um, when they entered her apartment in Kentucky. The story is just sad and hard to hear, hard to deal with. Um, and so for that reason, we recently created a two-color weasel graph poster. This was probably about a month ago to bring attention to the killers of Breonna Taylor, these police officers. Um, we drew inspiration from, of course, like the wanted poster or vintage letterpress posters. And we collaborated with a local weasel printer here in St. Louis. And he invited about five or so designers to create a suite of prints to be auctioned off and the proceeds will go to any art organization of the artist choosing. We chose to donate our proceeds to the Bell Project. And we knew going in that this poster would not be hung up in people's homes like the other prints part of the suite. Um, we created this specifically with the protesters in mind. You know, the, protest, the, the poster actually bears a large type lockup. You see bold colors, potent messaging. So again, it's taking the design and, and making it to a functional piece. Um, so it can be read quickly and also grab attention. And of course, we like to put some sort of subliminal messaging in our work, which we decided to use with, uh, if you've ever seen any old school posters, they have like the union logos and things of that nature. And then this happened. Uh, about a week and a half ago, um, I got a DM from a person I never met, don't know, via Instagram asking if we had any posters that they would like to purchase. And I literally came to tears. I broke down. And the reason I broke down is because this is why we fucking do this. We don't do it for likes. This is not to be these cool designers or, you know, get the, the respect as black designers that we rightfully deserve. Nothing, all of that is out of the window. This is our way of trying to help out however we can to be of service to humanity as a whole, especially being black creatives, being hunted like deer, worse than deer, right? Our society is in the 11th hour right now. We have a lot of work to do, so this is our way of doing the work. And so to get a message like this from a complete and total stranger in Louisville, it's hard not to get shaken up and filled with emotion. Now, we're gonna delve deeper, take the plane up a few altitudes. Um, Make us there, Kevin, come on. <laughs> uh, we took a turn from our work to speak on stereotypes. You know, stereotypes are simply cliche images or ideas about a particular type of person, or group, or thing. This here is Mary Melodies. It's called Cold Black Note Despelling, D7 Dwarfs which was directed by Bob Clampett. Go look it up, you can check, check it out. And it's basically a remake of Snow White with an all black cast filled with racial stereotypes. Plenty. Um, here's another one. This is from Tintin and his adventure in the Congo. Notice the black face there, hoisting up this, this white figure. Indoctrinating kids at a very early age. This is Tom and Jerry. You know, one would say that's not black face. Well, if you look at the hair, the hairstyle, like the breads, coil, black culture know exactly what they're talking about here. Let me make it very real to you. I saw this in person, no lie. This is a sculpture in front of a pizza store. So I was basically a visiting artist uh, for a residency that took place in Steuben, Wisconsin, very far north. Uh, it was closed every time I went into town. So Steuben, uh, I think from the lo local town that's nearby, it was about a 15 minute drive. So our, our residency was basically in the foothills. We would have to drive into town to get like regular provisions and things of that nature, about a 15 minute drive. And every time I went down there, the store was always closed. Because um, I just wanted to talk to the owner and ask a few questions. I was curious. And let's play a little game. I want you all that are listening to exercise a very critical eye. Can you tell me what you see? Is there anything specific that you notice about this sculpture?
The head has been knocked. What's that? The head has been knocked off before. I see like a crack on the neck. Yep, the head's been knocked off. What else? Looks like, the pain is, looks like the pain is coming off a little bit. Pain is coming off. Anyone else? It kind of looks like only the face is painted, like not even the back of the head. So here's, here's what's interesting. We're in Steuben, Wisconsin, way north. Winters can get very rough. Notice how pristine this looks. That paint is fairly new. It doesn't look or appear weathered at all. So this is well kept. That's what I thought was intriguing. I was like, I really want to talk to the owner. I just want to have a conversation. Of course, was I furious? Of course. I just want to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, let's break the rules from traditional lecture. Well, I think I've been doing that anyway. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask you all another question. Do you see anything unusual with this? Anyone, anything you see strange? more like aggressive uh-huh presented like almost animalistic ah aha uh -huh. ding 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 look at that now i believe this was created in 2008 for vogue magazine a photographer i believe was annie Leibovitz, mm -hmm. where she portrays one of our most famous athletes as a ferocious gorilla and i did some research and she said well you know that was not the intent you know uh and I said, look, if, look at the images side by side. So I put them together. Make no mistake. This was not happenstance. The pose, even the dress color is very similar. This is very subliminal messaging. But also, here's something that a lot of people didn't notice. Look at the devil horns where the O and the G meet right behind LeBron. This is the power of design and how design works on your subconscious. Depicted as animals. Black people were demonized. So for this reason, we decided to Rezo print a book. This is actually my wife's idea. This is all her conception. I was simply the client. I was the designer. She was the client. That's how she treated it. She's like, hey, I have this idea. I, I'm so sick of seeing, you know, blackface. You have big fashion houses like Prada and Gucci that have done things. Um, but that's more telling because they don't have anyone looking at what's going out the door. It just goes out so that it shows the lack of diversity. Um, and so she wanted to create this book. Um, and Black people in America have been taxonomized as savages, lazy, right? Dehumanized by mainstream media. And these are all derivatives of early scientific racism. You have pseudoscience. Carl Linnaeus is one you should look up. You should read that about that guy. He's very interesting. You know, and back in the 19th century, Blackface was primarily used by white performers to demean Black people. But it was also a source of entertainment. You know, the title of this publication is called Pot Calling the Kettle Black. You know, and that's an idiom used all across America in all black households. And it blatantly, it is blatantly telling about the hypocrisy. It was underscoring, right? And so this publication offers critical observation of the use of blackface and its variations found deeply embedded in cartoons, pop culture, the fashion industry, and beyond. Now, I had this idea to create a book. You know, we talk about working from, you know, a spiritual place. I actually saw this book in a dream. It appeared to me. I was asleep. I woke up. My wife's like, what are you doing? It's four in the morning. What's going on? And I had to just write it down, sketch it out. You think about artist books, you know, artist book, the term artist book, where a publication becomes a work of art in itself. And so this is more so, talking about, you know, all of these different photographers. So we have some local photographers, Jen Everett, uh, Marcus Stabnow, Chris Perrin. They all, you know, contributed these photographs. And here's what's, what's interesting about this. They've never really met each other, never been in the same space. But the way that they photograph people, places, things, really makes you take a closer look. You really get a chance to see shape, form, and texture, the materiality of objects. And that's what I thought was an underscoring theme, thematically speaking, that maybe we should uh, uh, try to address in this publication. And this whole book is printed on Tyvek. 
which has never really been done. And it was a pain in the ass to create. You have to use certain types of inks. It has to dry. The, product, the production cost is extremely expensive, but we wanted to make it affordable for everyone to enjoy. It's tear proof, Tyvek, it's water resistant. Uh, this book will probably be around more than I would be. <laughs> um, we had a beautiful essay um, that was, you know, created by Jackie Germain, wonderful writer, and then another beautiful poem by Alyssa Noli, who's all part of Visitor Assembly. Um, and so these images do just that. What's really important about looking at these photographs is trying to create some sort of sequence where this tells a story that makes you your eye kind of go on this, you know, journey to explore uh, these notions of shape, form, and function. And then, lastly, our last project, this is actually with, uh, my buddy has a firm, it's called Visitor Assembly. And we had a conversation, we were talking about, you know, black people, things that we, you know, were willfully omitted from the history books. You know, our histories are severely redacted. And in this conversation, just like most collaborations, people are really, you know, they don't know how to approach collaboration. I love collaboration. I feel like it's the best way to get rid of ego. You have different minds on, the, on a project that come together, and that's when the magic happens. And so Marcus and I, uh, it's called Assembly Play. So it's the combination of these two studios working together. So Visitor Assembly and Work Play to create these kind of bespoke items, um, you know, very thoughtful items. And so we had this conversation about the contributions of Black people. Um, we built a, quite a bit. As a matter of fact, uh, this T-shirt is laid behind the image of the White House, which is actually created with slave labor. A lot of people didn't know that. And so we wanted a very bold statement because we understand now is not the time to mince word or pull punches, right? Um, so as you see on this shirt, it says, it states, we built this shit, period. Those are the facts. Now, I did some research about some of these offerings, historical offerings that don't necessarily make public discourse. And I found one that I thought was really interesting, which is in Miami. And I wonder how many Floridians actually know this history. I think the number, don't quote me, was maybe 189 men total. Out of 189 men, there are around 30 to 50 men that were black, that they needed, that were workers building railroads. They needed the vote from these black men to actually incorporate Miami. How many people know that history and why is it suppressed? If you're suppressing these histories about the true contributions of all black people, men, women, and the like, then you can push these narratives about us being uh, lazy, right? Welfare recipients, savages. But people buy in and they subscribe to those narratives. They subscribe to the pseudoscience, which is actually BS. Because these, this information has been purpose, purposefully hidden from us, from everyone. And so we wanted to reposition these histories and do it in a way that people can feel proud. And this is for us. And so you see here, under that statement, in small text, in fine print, people can actually read what we have made, and this is just a few things. The list is very long. GPS was actually created by a black woman. Go look it up, right? But that's not common knowledge. The fact that it's not common knowledge is not the issue. It is why isn't it common knowledge? Why isn't it being taught? Especially to black children, right? You look at the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty, and this is going off, off subject with my presentation. I don't have a slide for it. If you ever look at the Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty actually has shackles at her feet. The original artist, his name was Bertholdi. He went to Africa, he, saw, he went to Egypt, he saw these sculptures, and he wanted to create a large sculpture to dedicate to the liberation of slaves. When it got to New York, they changed the idea. He said, I will let you change the idea, but the shackles must stay on the feet. How many people know that? If you don't believe me, there's a young lady that you should go look up. Her name is Dr. Joy DeGroy. I suggest all of you go look up her presentation and she talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome in which in this lecture, she actually addresses that fact about the Statue of Liberty. 
Because if people know these things, it will cause some cognitive dissonance. You have the things that you've been told and programmed to think, and you have actual truth. Completely different, two ends of the spectrum, right? So, I actually was on time. It's 12.36. That, <laughs> I think I would get to it as, as quickly. That is everything. Um, thank you so much for listening. I know this was a lot of stuff to discuss. Very deep. Um, I'm going to be honest, it's very painful sometimes to create this work. We do not enjoy making this work. We do it because it has to be done and people need to know the truth. All right. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, you willing to stick around and maybe uh, oh, of course. Some, some questions from of our course. faculty and students? Oh, there oh, he is. Hi. <laughs> this is Kevin, everybody. We can see him now. Well, you can see um, me now. Yes. <laughs> How are you all? All right, guys. So, uh, yeah, Kevin uh, specifically wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time um, for any questions uh, about their work or how they work together or, you know, basically anything. So does anybody have any questions right now? Uh, so from Jenna Bauer, we've got, can you speak uh, eventually on a few of your influences? Um, so uh, Jen, I don't know if you're speaking outside of like the cultural influences. So maybe like artists or designers that you guys um, have always admired perhaps? Oh, well, I mean, oof, the list, that's a long list. Um, oof, as far as, as far as, I mean, we're inspired by pretty much, there are a few groups. So there's jazz. Mm -hmm. So this morning, all morning, we were listening to Alice Coltrane, mm -hmm. you know, so that inspires us. Um, hold on one second. I don't want my computer to die. Okay. Um, you know, we read a lot of books. So there's Tony Morrison, of course, there's James Baldwin. Um, artists, I mean, Amy Sherrill, Glenn Ligon, um, Chris Ophelia, um, Lorna Simpson. I mean, we're inspired by pretty much everything, but also we're inspired by, more importantly, conversation, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of this information that we find out happens when we talk to our spiritual mentor. He shares a lot of stuff with us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're currently living in East St. Louis. This is the home of the East St. Louis massacre, the riots where black people were held here and women were beheaded, killed, right? And so we wouldn't have never known about that history had we not had those conversations. The same yeah. with my wife, like we have these conversations. My mother-in-law was talking to us about the brown paper bag test or you know the Blue Vein Society. I don't know if you all have ever heard of that, but it's basically um, black you know, uh, fraternities or social clubs Mm -hmm. using skin color as a bias. Well, if you're darker than a brown paper bag, you don't get access. Or you're so light that you can see your blue veins, you are given access to these social clubs. We had never heard of that. So I think it's a combination of all of these things, the music that we listen to, the times that we live in, you know, the artists that are creating this amazing work, right? Yeah. You know, um, even these conversations with our family. You know, those histories, those, those oral histories that are being passed down. And for us, that's important for our daughter. You know, I, I have a confession. I just started finding out about Baldwin four years ago. You know, I feel, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm lacking. I'm trying to play catch up, right? Yeah, I mean, I, went, I, think, that, I think that's all of us. Yeah, I went to high school. I, I read about a- Did us a major disservice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, all of these things are, are inspiration for us. Right. Who else has a question? We still got quite a few people logged on. We can talk. It doesn't have to be yes. questions. We can all just talk, you know. I'm loose with it. They get they get so shy whenever I, I kick it over <laughs> to the question. Um, what was the name again of the uh, presentation or lecture you were talking about with the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, so... Um, Dr. Joy DeGroy. Joy DeGroy. Um, Joy DeGroy. And I think DeGroy is D E capital G R U Y. And her lecture is on the post traumatic slave syndrome. 
which basically there are things that she's realized or done research black people suffer from from the traumas of ancestors which is true it's literally ingrained in our dna and people don't think that's real but it is four or five years ago uh, a friend of mine she's from jamaica she sent me this um document to read where they did a test with lab mice and they would shock the mother uh, every time they introduced, you know, um, the scent of lavender, they would shock her in the cage. And before she had offspring, they would do this. She had offspring, and they just wanted to see if the little tiny baby mice would respond to the smell of lavender, even though they didn't get shocked. Mm -hmm. This is something that was embedded in the memory of the mother. It's traumatic experience. It basically created a Pavlovian system, mm -hmm. right? And Soon as they introduced the scent of lavender into the cage, even though these baby mice never been shot, they freaked out. Yeah. So it's telling, like some of these things that we suffer is because it happened in our ancestral line. And these things we still have not been able to resolve. They're deeply embedded. And that, that, that talk was just eye-opening for us. When I think that oral history, I mean, like, it's not that long ago, you know, it's just like, you you still hear those stories because it wasn't that long ago right people that you are related to and it it affected them directly exactly imagine reading and seeing images of black people swinging from trees being cut burned ears were torn off of their bodies the dead bodies the souvenirs and then it's 2020 mm -hmm. and people are still being mysteriously hung we're oh, haunted yeah. by these past ills today Mm -hmm. that's that's a lot of emotional toil to carry right come on more questions for kevin we got him for longer hey kevin and yes, family sir. how's How it going you? i'm good i'm good uh it's good to see you um see you. hey i was wondering as you were talking and looking at back at some of the work i wonder if you believe hope and beauty are important aspects to come through in your work or if you think that it doesn't necessarily have to be there yet? Uh, so this is, this is an argument that my wife and I have quite a bit is- Good, I'm bringing up bad, I'm bringing up bad domestic stuff. No, 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 no. Any great duo have their arguments, trust That's me. Right. Like, <laughs> like we get on stage, you know, no one knows, but behind the stage, sometimes we battle about ideas. Uh, my wife is wanting to depart and go towards that direction of celebrating blackness or peace or tranquility or carving out space for black people, straight, gay, trans, doesn't matter. Um, I wanna dig into the history so it doesn't happen again. So we're at this crossroad and now we're starting to shift where it's so much going on that now we have to shift and show a more positive viewpoint because people just don't have the mental space we're already in the margin as is. And so now I think we're making that transition. That's an excellent question. We're making that transition to just celebrate culturally who we are. I think that's our next stage because that's something that's not really celebrated. We live in a world where this is full of anti-blackness, right? Even if you Google the word black, you go down a few definitions and it starts to get evil, sinister, evoking the devil, right? These things are always being used. Oh, he was in a black hoodie, right? And so we want to we want to position black people in a way where they can feel empowered or have carve out space. And I think a lot of artists are starting to do that to reclaim spaces that we couldn't inhabit. This I'm is just this hello. <laughs> hi, nice to meet you. This is this is this is the other half. That's our that's our daughter. All right, let me check this. I hope take that answers your question. It feels it feels like a man. It feels like a real tough thing to say as a white man, honestly, about like yeah. But where's the good in all this? Because yeah. I know that sometimes we're not ready to talk about good and can't see good in the stuff that's happening, you know. But I wonder, just thinking about you know, beyond that initial that hit of truth, what comes next, you know? Yeah, I think I think for us, like Danny and I have been talking about you know these shows where they're more so of an experience. You know, um, we actually want to create a book. This, it would be Rizograph. Maybe we can collaborate um, 
and I can find some money to get cheaply, you know, some paper and just one color. But mm -hmm. a book that it's like a survivalist hand guide for black yeah. people, right? Like some of the things that we've used to help put us or situate us in a, a good mental space, despite everything that's going on, like mm -hmm. meditation, you know, being around water, you know, these Tibetan bowls, music that we listen to, you know, books to read, that just puts you in a different place um, to give you some sort of, you know, outlook, positive outlook. And I think that's kind of the next stage. I think we're starting to, you know, veer that direction now. Well, yeah, I think that, that still has like this in it, I think inherently this criticism that you would even need that as a black man, you know, growing up in America, you know, so that criticism is still there. But I, I like that idea that it shows, okay, what comes after that, that acting critical, being critical toward a society, toward a system, um, you know, and those coping mechanisms, I think are really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Well, and it's also acknowledging that like, you know, mental health isn't isn't purely like something that needs to be addressed in the white community but that like there's a lot going on and 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 it's it's okay to sort of address that right and, and we we all have to take care of ourselves that's what makes us human right right because i think there is a <clears throat> i think there can be a stigma you know uh around mental health just in general and so mm -hmm. it's i think it's important to sort of see you guys, you know, addressing that. Thank you, thank you much. I think it's really important. No, it's, it's it, it, there are times, you know, I, I, there was a piece that Danielle did, it was Say Her Name, and it, it was like almost these prayer flags, but it was all the names of people that have been taken too soon due to violence, whether it's police brutality or not. And it lists the age, and I think the youngest was maybe eight, my wife knew the stories of all of these people and silk screening those 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 like flags was very difficult for her it was very difficult for me when she told me these stories um and so this this work is this work is uh is is heavy you know i think some folks may think that you know we make this stuff to be shock job but we don't you know we're just not in a comfortable place and we're reflecting you know that discomfort mm -hmm. um but to take's point going forward we're trying to now carve out spaces for those that are marginalized so they can breathe right like we're in st louis or east st louis and it just you are a product of your environment you feel like things are steady just compressing you know we go out we just went to go look at the Mies van der Rohe house which is maybe an hour outside of chicago just just nature and i just felt like i can breathe that's like I want everyone to feel that, but especially Black people, because we're just under the microscope constantly. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful book. I haven't had the chance to read it yet, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to butcher his name, Franz Fanon, mm -hmm. uh, Black Skin, White Mask. I, I read it. I, I started reading it in grad school when I was working on my thesis, and he talked about being judged in like three persons. So like, Historically speaking, you're being judged, you're being judged at that moment, you're being judged how you look or carry yourself or known association all at once. And that feels out of body. And I think that's the reason why we're starting to shift now to, um, you know, just making a space for people to, as an access point, despite everything that's happening. Uh, all right, so we have a, we have a we have a question in the chat. In your mind, is dismantling colorism a step to addressing institutionalized racism? Repeat that again. I'm sorry. It says, in your mind, is dismantling colorism a step to addressing institutionalized racism? I think so. I mean, so color. The the one the, the unique thing about colorism is it happens it happens a lot in the black community. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a step. I don't think that's, I think it's multi-pronged uh, because there are people of color that are not really in these very high positions. You know, if you think about people that sit on the boards or folks that are making decisions or even some of these fashion houses where you have offensive material going out the door, there was no one on at the top of that pyramid to say, hey, this is not cool. This is going to be taken this way. Um, I think addressing colorism is helpful so people understand the negative impact that it has i don't think we talk about that enough in the black community 
that there's this divide, which all is uh, derivative from slavery, you know? So you have the field Negro and house Negro, mm -hmm. right? And the lighter the skin, the better the treatment. Yeah. The darker, you know, you're out in the field, ugly, vile. Mm -hmm. um, those things certainly exist in institutional settings. But again, it's the person that is exercising that that is oftentimes not of color, right? We just internalize it in the black community. So there is a difference. I don't know if that answers the question or not. I do think pop culture is a big part of it though. I mean, yeah. and, and, and there's like major ties from historically of just like, like, like pop culture and the, you know, upper echelon of people who run that it's, it's, it's fetish, fetishizing. Yeah. You know, certain types of, of, of people. And, and again, it creates those like, those divides like yeah. the black community. I mean, look at, look at, so we did a series of, of prints. Um, they were lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a set of five, four of which were from Kanye West. Mm -hmm. uh, one of Kanye West's earliest albums. This is what he said. I'm going to say what he said. Brace yourselves. <laughs> he says in this record, I'm going to make sure these light-skinned <laughs> niggas never, ever, ever come back in style. But that's telling. You have a person like Kanye West who does not have to give two shits about what people think mm -hmm. of him. He's gotten notoriety. He has his own status, has all of these creative projects that he's doing, right? Kind of the top of his game, sonically speaking. And you have him dealing with colorism. That is so telling. I don't think people really focus on that lyric. And he said something else. He's like, you know, remember Al B? from Black Street, he was Black as the street was. Again, mm -hmm. he's addressing something that maybe he's dealing with internally. Mm -hmm. I knew for a reason, I knew for a fact, when I grew up in grade school, I couldn't, really, no girls wanted to talk to me because I was dark. They wanted to think what they called a pretty boy, right? Um, so I think it's, I think black, the Black community has to address that, but in terms of colorism and institutional settings, you know, there's not people of color at the very top. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just dealing with anti-blackness, you know? Yeah. That's my opinion. No, I think you're right. All right. Any other questions? Come on, guys. We got him for a few more minutes before we have to give him back to his family. <laughs> Let's see. We Sorry to go so deep here on so many things. It's okay. <laughs> it's, well, I mean, that's... That's what we're here for, right? Let's right. Talk about this stuff. Can I ask a question or make a yeah. comment? Of course. Okay, good. I wasn't sure. I've been dealing with some microphone issues. I can see you. You're good. Right. Thank you so much for your, your lecture. What I noticed and what I really appreciate is like a, a nonviolent communication style that you employ when you speak about things that are difficult. Like, I'm always waiting for somebody to be offended by something that you're saying, somebody that thinks differently, but you, I don't know if you can speak to it, but the, you, you know what I'm talking about? It's like a way where you're speaking your truth, but you're also not really ruffling feathers, you know? Even though if people really listen to your truth, you're making them think, but you're not agitating them. Yeah, some of, some of the work that we've made in the past has agitated people. Yeah. Um, Again, we like to be very subliminal with how we position messaging. Um, we've learned that sometimes it's just based to put it's if you put out the information that a lot of people don't know, right? Here's the facts. Okay, here's what you were told. Here are the facts. And then step away. Mm -hmm. and say, All right. How do you take this? Exactly. What's your viewpoint now? that you have this information. I don't know if anyone, I used to watch Asian Aliens on TV, on Netflix. And what's interesting about that show is like, oh, did the ship show up here? You know, could it be this? Like they show, they tell you like a few things and then they leave it to you with the viewer to kind of parse through where you stand with the information that they presented. And I think that's what we try to do. Like, all right, here are the facts. Here's some things that we found. And then let me know what you get from that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those facts are offensive because people don't want to accept those truths. 
right? For well, that information. And maybe that's the offensive part of it. Calling it out is offensive. It doesn't necessarily have to be the worst. Just I'm calling this out. And some people were really peed about that mural in the West End. There was another one that I didn't show. And it was chalkboard paint. And it had one line that says, dear white people, where's the accountability? And some worker wrote on there, all lives matter. And it's like, okay, I hear you. But not every life is being hunted down and gunned down without justice served. Mm -hmm. Right? Even blue lives. I'm not saying that all cops are bad. I think there are some that cross the line. But again, it's not about blue life. If a cop takes off his uniform, he's black, and he goes out, he's subjected now to the same treatment as everyone else. Yeah. Because he's not wearing the badge and the uniform. And that has happened. There are cops that have actually been shot that are black because they weren't in uniform, but they were cops. So it means that blue lives means nothing. You're still a black man or woman in America mm -hmm. and you put right in the same pot. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope that answers the question, hopefully. Well, I also just think that like you and you and Danielle just happen to be kind of like really uh approachable people to talk to just in general just from from our conversation we had yesterday i think you're just easy to talk to but oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's just my opinion thank you thank you what else we got any other final questions for kevin what's next oh, what's, what's next well there's, so there's, if you go to the website, go check out that uh, Tyvek book, just read about it, look at it. Um, also, we have a show coming up at Monaco. Uh, I think that opens next month. And it's, it's a Tate's um, question. It is celebrating Blackness. It's unapologetic, um, which is something we've, we've never really explored. Mm -hmm. We've been so fixated on the problems that exist um, that we want to thrust Black people up, position them at a high place. And so this show aims to do that in the midst of, you know, the turmoil and the hatred that is that exists. Um, I think beyond that, experiences. And you said you that know, once at Monaco? Yes. Yes, okay. it opens right. in a month at Monaco. Yeah. Send yeah, so me the info so I can share it with everybody. For sure. We're really excited about that. And I think, you know, eventually it will become these experiences, you know, the Black experience. And what does that mean? You know, culturally, music. You know, when I think about when I go to my, you know, family's house, music that's being played, how does it smell? All mm -hmm. of these things, you know, incense that are burning. You know, things that you look at, make creating an, an actual experience. I think that's kind of the next stage. You know, working with composers to maybe do scores. You just sit and listen, right? Like, that's where we want to go next. You know, we are truly defining what Black is because everyone else seems to have a definition. So we want to take that back. It's like, nope, we're going to define it this way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this new body of work is attempting to do. I think that's great. Thank sort of you. taking the parts that you want from that definition, turning them on their head, and then redefining it. Exactly. We're saying I don't fit in that box. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Well, Kevin, I believe we're at that time. Thank you so much for talking to us. Thank um, you all so much. Um, yeah, that was great. That Thank was awesome. you. Thank, Thank you for you. giving us so much space to kind of like ask questions and uh, just have a dialogue. I know that was something that me and you said we wanted to make happen. So Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, yeah, of on course. On behalf of Danielle and myself. Yes. I can't wait fun. to see the, the, the new work. It sounds really, really uplifting. And I think we all kind of need that right now. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some potent stuff that we've been working on. So it should be, should be fun. Good. Should be fun. Awesome. Well, you have a wonderful day. And uh, yeah, I'll try to remember to send you the recording so you can have a copy of it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. All See right. See you all. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, bye. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day.
Have a nice day.